Alrighty, we've got a few people. We're just waiting on arrival, and we're oh, we're good to go. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to today's information session on spot form of net blotch SDHI resistance uh, in WA info session, uh, which will be is brought to you by the Australian Fungicide Resistance Extension Network, which is a GRDC initiative um, and investment to make sure that growers have the best information they can moving forward to manage fungicide resistance. So um, today we've got Fran Lopez Ruiz and Wes Mayer from the Centre for Crop and Disease Management at Curtin University. Um, presenting for us who um, managed the kind of discovery of this uh, with a regional um, agronomist, sorry. So I will leave you in their capable hands and we'll get going and this will be recorded. So if you have to duck out, you can come back to it later. Um, I might just grab the next slide, Fran. Yep, so just some quick housekeeping. Everyone will be automatically muted and that's just to keep things audibly simple. To ask a question though, you will need to use the Q&A window. You can use the chat and we'll certainly see it, but we'll usually be able to see who you are as well. Um, and very unlikely event of a webinar hacking, you'll get sent another link. So next slide, Fran, is just to show you how to Q&A, so it's at the bottom of your screen, click on the Q&A, you can choose to send it anonymously um, and we'll answer all of those at the end of the presentation. Next slide. So AFRIN is a network, as I said, it's regionally specific because the risks are different across Australia in terms of fungicide resistance and of course today we're talking about a WA case study um, and over the course of AFRIN we'll be doing a whole lot of um, a guide, some workshops, information sessions like today and a whole lot of information's on the website there if you want to get onto them. Uh, but I'll leave you in Fran and Wes's capable hands now. Yeah. Right, thank you very much Kylie. Um, so I guess this. Um, can you hear me? Kylie, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, excellent. So just trying to make sure that my uh, colorful broken English doesn't actually get in the way of, you know, um, this uh, little presentation. So we wanna make this a little bit more conversational than actually, you know, like a formal presentation. And Wesley and I, we're gonna be just, you know, just going through, through, the, through, the, through the details and just exposing the issue, right? And I think that the, the conversation probably has to go around more the management practices going forward than anything else, right? Um, I have to say that I have taken a, a great, uh, well, great deal of slides from um, our colleague, Jeff Thomas from Deeper, that he and, and Wesley, they presented a, a webinar just recently on, on Western Australian resistance, especially in DMI resistance uh, about three weeks ago. Um, some of the slides actually were very good. so. Some of this material actually is coming from their presentation. So, look, uh, um, probably uh, just to 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 start with a little bit of background to this problem. Um, spot for a blotch in uh, in Western Australia is actually wide, widespread, as you know, many of you uh, probably already know. Um, and that basically uh, is a consequence of a few different things, and I've got them just summarized there on, on this slide. So there is probably more than 90% of the crop area zone to susceptible or very susceptible varieties of barley, okay? So there is a high level of disease out there because uh, the varieties we're using, unfortunately, don't have the, the tolerance or the resistance level required in order to keep that disease, you know, uh, at lower levels. And it is also true that there is an important area zone to continuous barley. So we are actually quite, uh, quite well aware of Valley and Valley uh, um, paddocks that, you know, just, just for various, various different reasons, either because the, the soil is, is not conducive for growing other things or because that's actually the, the type of rotation that actually has been working or, or because, you know, people just like doing what they've been doing for a while. It's been actually, you know, uh, uh, has been good for them in the past. 
and and also there is so uh, there's this tendency to you know increase early sowing, um, uh, which obviously um, it has benefits, but also um, we can you know end up having issues in terms of you know this is low. So at the end of the day, uh, these are the main drivers or some of the main drivers uh, um, that are basically yes um, are responsible for this higher prevalence of spot for net blotch um, in Bali growing areas. Um, just another slide that was that was prepared by uh, Jeff Thomas just recently um, and, and summarizing really um, the compounds, the majority of the compounds that are available for the control of, um, of this pathogen uh, on Bali, uh, they might seem like, you know, a good deal of them, but actually they are very limited in terms of uh, the mode of actions uh, that we've got available. So in reality, everything or almost everything contains a group three compound. Group three is a DMI fungicide. And then we've got a few compounds that are, have been have been recently introduced, uh, group seven or SDHIs, uh, that are the purpose of this, this little uh, presentation today. And also we've got um, um, uh, formulations containing group 11 chemicals as to reluins, right? So, but again, the great deal of the formulation contain group three DMIs. And just to remind a little bit what uh, Wesley and Jeff were presenting uh, presenting on recently, there is a lot of resistance to DMI chemicals in net blotch diseases, not just a spore form, but also net form, okay? Um, I don't know if uh, some of you or many of you are familiar with this, uh, with this slide, but um, this slide is, is basically what really made us aware of uh, a problem with SDHI resistance in the Job Peninsula in South Australia in 20, 2019. Now, um, I think that is very important um, to just recognize the part of history here, right? Because that's really what is driving the problem. Um, these are barium body paddocks, right? Sistive and sistive up from, right? And so basically selection pressure is there year after year, and we don't have a rotation that allows us to, to break from, you know, from that cycle. And uh, we are not incorporating actually, you know, uh, the chemical rotation either, right? And, and in many of the cases, not all the cases, people were using the same variety of barley, okay? It's not just the same crop, it's even the same variety. Now uh, that was um, Joe Peninsula in South Australia last year. Um, now these are pictures from um, uh, Canberling, right? Uh, 2020, just um, about a couple of months ago. Yeah, maybe a couple of months ago that we were doing a survey there. And Wesley will be talking about the results in a minute. Um, and you can see that plant history is actually very, very similar, right? It's Bali and Bali, at least since 2018, right? And Sistiva and uh, since 2018 as well. Okay, um, this particular situation, um, many of the many of the areas that are high certainty is actually uh, a problem, right? And, and Bali is seen as you know, seen as a, as a good choice in those cases, right? But the problem is that um, well, if we are losing the capacity to rotate those crops, we are not uh, putting enough attention into rotating the chemicals, right? In if we're still using the same chemicals, we're gonna end up with exactly the same situation, right? And that's actually what has happened, all right? Um, just to um, make sure that everybody's on the same page with regards to the, to the wording that we're using here, the nomenclature that we're following, um, we, we have classified the, the resistance or the different sensitivity levels to the, to the chemicals in three categories. So sensitive, is, uh, is an isolate taken, collected from a sample, or isolated from a sample um, that is um, sensitive to the, to, the, to the chemistry. And in the field, what you are going to basically say is that if you apply the chemistry, that treatment that you've been uh, using for a while, um, you're gonna have no issues. You're not have, you, are, you are not going to have any issues controlling the disease, right? So your label rate is going to work, you know, perfectly fine, right? Now, when you when you have a reduced sensitivity population, what you're going to see in the field is probably a small decline on the effectivity of the compound. You're still going to be able to control the, the, the disease and normally just increasing uh, the rate that's basically achieved um, easily. Um, and in the lab, as you can see in the left-hand side, that's actually what it looks like, right? And in vitro assay, 
you have something that grows a little bit on media, right? But it doesn't look like, you know, uh, it is very happy. That is a reduced sensitive strain, all right? That will be the translation of what you see in the field in the lab. Now, a resistant strain or a resistant population in the field that basically means that you've got field failure. So you use the chemi chemistry and you don't achieve uh, satisfactory control. And if you have a look at the picture, that actually is what it looks like in the lab. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an isolate, right, of the fungus that grows quite happily on media, and sorry, I didn't mention this, amended with the fungicide that we're using for the control. Now, what does resistance look like in the field? So I've got a little picture there of uh, DMI resistance in uh, barley paddocks in South Australia. Um, and this is basically uh, is Neblodge. In this case, it's slightly different. It's a hybrid between Neblodge uh, spot form and net form Neblodge, right? But that's basically what we are talking about when we when we refer to resistance, is the is the is a lack of control using uh, raised their level rates. And I'm just gonna uh, pass the slides on to Wesley so he can talk about the results. We got initially notified there was potentially an issue um, with loss of control in a particular paddock, um, which is the one that's highlighted in the center, um, which was around the Cumberland region. Um, so we, following uh, the detection or the report of that, we did a field survey where we went to five um, paddocks um, in about a, a 10 kilometer radius from the Cunderdon. Um, and we collected over 120 um, samples in transects. Um, and from that, we got um, 300, over 300 um, net blotch lesions that we analyzed. Um, and we basically screened them on levels of SDH high fungicides as well as DMI fungicides, um, basically corresponding to the what Fran was mentioning earlier about sensitive versus reduced sensitivity versus resistant. Um, so we have here now the results from that survey essentially showing we've got um, resistance is has been found in three out of the five paddocks that we surveyed, um, ranging from two to five percent frequency. So relatively low frequency of um, resistant isolates. And then we've got um, in four of the five paddocks, we have reduced sensitivity. Um, and in a couple of those paddocks, we have them 12 to 18%. And then in a couple of the other paddocks, including the original site, we have between 52 to 58% uh, showing reduced sensitivity. Um, and as, as I mentioned, we also screened DMIs um, and about 2% of all the um, isolates that we'd screened um, were showing at least some reduced sensitivity level to both the SDHI, in this case, fluxoprioxide, and also to the DMI, um, tepiconazole. So just looking at the original site that's highlighted in the, the center, so we got isolate. We got um, isolates from one original plant that was sent to us from that site, um, and we screened for sensitivity. And then, of twelve um, isolates from that original plant that were showing reduced sensitivity, we sequenced the um, SDH target genes. Um, in all 12 of those isolates to look for different mutations. Um, so what we actually found is that in just that one plant from that one site that we uh, screened, we found actually there was three different um, known resistance mutations that have been found. So I'll just go um, quickly through them. So we found in one out of the 12 isolates we got uh, this mutation H134R in the SDHC gene. Um, so that is a mutation that has been reported in um, NetBlotch um, in the literature 
Um, for example, in Europe, um, where it has been correlated with um, high levels of SDHI resistance. And this is actually the same mutation that we've seen in the net form of net blotch in the York Peninsula uh, last year. And I've also got here on the um, right hand side, this mutation is also associated with high levels of resistance in some other um, important plant pathogens as well. Um, so one out of the 12 had that mutation. Another one out of the 12 isolates that we screened had another mutation, which was D145G in the SDHD gene. Um, and again, this mutation has been previously described um, in net blotch, uh, where it's associated with low to moderate levels of SDHR resistance. And again, this is another mutation that we've also seen in the net form of net blotch uh, last year in um, the York Peninsula of South Australia. And then finally, we've got the predominant mutation that we found in that initial sample was 10 out of 12 isolates had um, mutation N75S in SDHC. And again, this is a mutation that's associate, associated with low to moderate SDHI resistance in net blotches. Um, and unlike the previous two that I mentioned, this one has not actually been described in, well, we haven't found this one in South Australia in the net form, net blotch cases. So this one is, um, in Australia at least, is unique to spot form and in WA only that we've found it. Um, so with that, I'll pass back to Fran. Um, look, uh, um, as I was saying at the very beginning, um, probably we didn't want to keep or to make this very complicated, very complex. So, um, and I think that the, that the value is to probably understand where the issue is and, and what the options are, right? So I'm just gonna be talking a little bit about um, IDM and how can, we, how can we address this problem, right? And, and then we'll go into basically the questions, right? So um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that most of you are, are very familiar with, uh, with IDM practices. For us, it's actually like a, like a tandem, one of those fancy tandem bikes, right? With three riders, right, on, the, on it. So basically our first rider is gonna be the variety selection. So we really need to make sure that the varieties we're using are the right ones, okay? And that's easy to say in, in some cases, but in Western Australia, it's not easy to say that um, for the control of the blotches, right? So, well, that rider is not going to be performing very well, but we've got non-chemical farm management approaches right as well, okay? And, and that includes crop rotation, right? Because remember, we, we might have resistance to net blotches on barley. That resistance is not gonna transfer to wheat or to canola okay or even to follow right or to pastures okay and 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 trust me those those organisms are not resistant to fire and i know that fire is you know is, is probably a bit of a taboo um but i'm not talking about uh widespread burnings um, i'm talking about strategic burnings so that might be a solution in some cases or at least one of the tools that we can use in order to manage this problem okay the management of the stubble all right, because this is a stable born disease, all right? And, and just using again slides from, from our friend Jeff, um, you might see a paddock with that beautiful stable protecting the soil. Um, what we see under the microscope is what you've got on the right hand side. If that stable has been there, you know, it's a barley on barley, and that stable has been there for a while, and that stable is probably very, very uh, rich in disease. So, and that disease is just waiting for the first rains in order to um, start expressing. And, and what is going to, to happen is that um, those fruiting bodies are going to produce heaps of spores and those spores are going to be infecting very, very soon the, the new barley seedlings um, in, the, in the next season, right? Um, and then we've got fungicides. Okay, that's our third rider. So it's not the most important one, even though it, it receives a lot of attention. It's not the most important one. It's one that we have to rely on when there's, when there's actually nothing else that we can do, right? So it's something that we use to complement everything else that we've done before, okay? So the foundations are the variety selection and the non-chemical farm management practices, all right? So fungicides are there just to make sure 
that everything works in this um, in this uh, tandem. Okay. Now, what's going to happen if um, if we don't have these three elements working together nicely or as nicely as possible? Well, exactly the same as what would happen if you know you don't coordinate what you're uh, riding on a tandem bike. I don't know if you experienced that before, but that ends up with you on the ground. Okay, and it's not pleasant. I've done that. Um, so some chemical management tips, uh, this is not rocket science. Um, what's the best thing you can do in order to avoid fungicide resistance? Well, not to use fungicides, okay? So limit the applications as much as you can. All right, that's probably one of the best strategies. If you don't need it, why would you use it? Okay, and it's easy to say again, but you know, in our current uh, chemical programs, it's, it's actually harder not to include those those chemicals when we're going to be spraying for other things anyway. Um, choose the right fungicide. Okay, not every fungicide is as effective against every disease. So choose the right fungicide that will help you controlling that disease that you that you're after. Okay. And if you've got resistance in your paddock, obviously choosing the right fungicide is going to become paramount, right? Because you might be using the fungicide towards which you've got uh, resistance developing, all right? And you don't want that. Okay. Um, try to use different chemical tools in order to manage those pathogens, right? Instead of relying on one, one particular mode of action, why not use them two if you can? You're going to be, you're going to be, um, hitting that pathogen from two completely different angles. And it's going to be much more difficult for the pathogen to A, survive, and B, develop resistance towards against the two compounds at the same time, to the two mode of actions, right? So it's going to be much, much harder, okay? Um, I've got here never use the same group three fungicide consecutively, but I could actually say never use the same fungicide at all, right, uh, consecutively, okay? So it doesn't need to be a group three. So I think that it should apply to every fungicide, all right? We've got enough fungicides in our portfolios in order to rotate those chemistry. So please don't use the same chemical uh, uh, consecutively. Try to alternate them, all right? So um, avoid, avoid using group seven and group 11 chemicals uh, more than once per season. And this is because they are quite different uh, from group three chemicals in the way that they can develop or or pathogens can develop resistance against them, right? So these, these compounds are much more prone uh, to resistance developing just because of the way they, 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 they act, right? And the pathogens level, okay? So don't, don't use them more than once per season. That would be actually much better, all right? Um, also, try not to use fungicides when you've got already disease levels at a very, you know, at, uh, at, at, at sorry, disease at the very high levels, right? Um, because that's actually when your fungicide is going to be working uh, 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 the least, right? I mean, you're going to have too much disease to control for the same level rate you're going to be applying, right? Even if you apply the highest level rate, disease levels are going to be too high, okay? So this is a numbers game. So try to control the disease when uh, the levels are still, you know, within reasonable parameters, all right? Um, but having said that, always work within label rates, okay? So going um, about label rate is as bad as actually cutting the rates and going below level rates. Just work within level rates, within level rates, and try um, to adjust your level rate so that you can achieve effective control, okay? And lastly, um, obviously, monitor your crop and you should place resistant, resistance, submit a sample, okay? That doesn't mean submitting a sample every time that, that you can. So just have a thought about it. Am I using the right, uh, am I following the, the, uh, the label specifications? Am I using the, light, the right rate? Is the season too conducive for the disease? And this is why I'm seeing high expression of, the, of, this, of this problem. Um, if everything basically ticks and you still have concerns, send a sample, all right? And I will be very happy to, to test it, okay? So just to, to recap some technical messages here uh, about what Wesley and I have been just talking about. Um, so reduce sensitivity to group uh, seven chemicals, or so SDHIs, has been found in the Western Australia Central with the region around Canterbury. So the reduced sensitivity, remember the nomenclature we were talking about before, 
sensitive, reduced sensitive, and resistant. So the reduced sensitivity was around 39%. The resistant population, the fully resistant population, was around 2%, which is actually, you know, uh, low, right? But that doesn't mean that it's not important, okay? Because even at those low levels, um, we could still see uh, effects in the field. And that's probably because the reduced sensitivity population is having a higher effect than we anticipated, okay? against those treatments. Um, both cases are associated with mutations in the target site of the, of the SDHF fungicides as Wesley was talking about before, right? So he, he was, he was uh, showing you some mutations that he found in the analysis of those samples. And also he was, he was, he was talking about how these mutations have been found before in not only in blotches but also in other organisms, okay? At least two of the mutations one of the one of the mutations was only only found in the clothes. So um, the resistance might not be very evident or not as evident as in the York Peninsula situation because of the low frequency, and this is in line to what I was saying before. Um, but you know, uh, I think that this is a very good we're in a very good position because we we managed to identify this early enough. Now, the reason why we managed to identify this early enough, and I think this is very important to take into account, is because the industry was watching, right? And we had, you know, head staff from, from somebody in the industry that was, you know, closely following uh, what the situation was with regards to these paddocks, right? Because he had concerns about, you know, the management of these particular paddocks, okay? So the continuous selection, obviously, will lead to fast growth of the resistant population, right? Even though the, low, the frequency of the resistant population is low, um, if we keep following the same sort of approach, we keep using this barley and barley uh, uh, rotation with upfront uh, SDHIs, or now that actually we've got availability of other foliar SDHIs, the selection pressure is going to, be going to keep increasing, and the end result is going to be higher frequency of the resistant population and less effectivity of the chemicals that contain SDHIs. Now, I don't know if you, if you picked up on something that was, that was talking about, that was the dual resistance to both SDHIs and DMIs. There was around 2.7% of the uh, population analyzed that was resistant to both DMIs and SDHIs. So, if we rely on these two compounds, obviously what is going to happen if we don't change our approach, our management approach, is that this dual resistance is going to increase. So the problems are going to be uh, double concerning, all right? And finally, uh, if you suspect resistance, send a sample for testing, okay? Um, and because at the end of the day, um, we really believe that this, this association between uh, us in the lab just trying to identify resistance as you guys in the field uh, managing this problem works well when you know both of us are actually watching all right and i think i don't have anything else to say kali uh, just to acknowledge the contributions of a lot of people here dan taylor from dkt rural agencies that was actually the agronomist that was um uh, has been involved in this since uh, the very beginning uh, cool Chandra, one of the very switch on technicians uh, that has been doing um, the bulk of the of the analysis together with Wesley, right? Um, the broader fungicide resistance group that has been contributing to this analysis, and obviously the Australian Fungus Services and Extension Network for uh, for all the the support, um, obviously uh, provided by you know uh, with the with the investment of GRDC. Thank you very much. And if you've got any questions, we are more than happy to, yeah, to spend a few minutes just, you know, just going around the answers. Alrighty, thanks a lot for that, Fran. That was great. Um, we do have a question already. So uh, Rory Block has asked, would you be able to explain the implications of spraying fungicides under and over the label rates in terms of what it does to the wild type populations? You want me to answer that one? Yep, if you can. Yeah. <laughs> I know you could probably spend almost a whole lesson on it, but um, uh, yeah. No, that's, uh, that's actually uh, that's a very good question, and, and we get that question very often, uh, um, not only from the industry, but also from, from our students uh, here at uni. 
Um, look, uh, the situation is a slightly different compared to, to weeds. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, the person that was asking the question is, is familiar with, uh, with, the, with the label rates and, and uh, herbicide resistance control or management, but you know, for herbicide resistance, the highest rate is always recommended, okay? And now for fungicide resistance, for fungicide resistance, not for disease management, but for fungicide resistance, the lower, the lowest rate is always recommended, okay? Now, the reason why this is different in both uh, uh, fungi and, and weeds is just basically based on the genetic makeup of both organisms, okay? So um, in, in weeds, we've got, we've got a, um, a more complex, more genetically complex organisms that actually can lead to uh, heterozygous um, genotypes, while in, um, in fungi, that normally doesn't happen, okay? Um, so now, this, this recommendation is based on a lot of research. There are plenty of uh, papers uh, in the literature that basically are uh, in agreement uh, with, uh, with this advice, so that using lower rates are going to contribute to lower resistance development, right? Now, specifically with your question, what happens when you use, when you use a lower rate as opposed to a higher rate, uh, or compared to a higher rate, in the lower rate scenario, and I'm not talking about cutting the rate, I'm talking about using a lower rate within our label range, right? In a lower rate scenario, so the risk of resistance developing is going to be lower, okay? Um, just because that population that you are hitting with your, with your chemical is going to be more viable. So we're gonna have from wild type, fully sensitive strains to reduced sensitive strains and fully resistant strains. And that variability, what it's gonna create is, is a bit of a cocktail so that when we use a different chemical, so those organisms that are slightly different are gonna compete against each other. And normally, this is something that happens very often, the resistant population is going to be outcompeted by the less resistant organisms. So that basically guarantees that we're gonna be able to bring back those chemistries, right? If we keep a healthy rotation. Now, if we use a higher rate or the, the highest rate possible or authorized, what we're going to have is that effectively we're going to wipe out all the all the less resistant uh, individuals, right? So reduced sensitive and wild types are going to disappear from from this cocktail, and we're going to have just the one thing that is going to be the very resistant strain. Now the very resistant strain doesn't have anything to compete against, right? So nothing is going to try or to even you know be able to outcompete this resistant strain. So if we were to remove now the selection pressure, the fungicide, that resistance strain is gonna stay. In a low rate scenario, we remove the selection pressure and now everything can compete against this resistance strain, okay? I don't know if I if it took a little bit of a detour to explain, you know, um, but that's basically the main reason, right? It's competition at the end of the day. Yeah, but and even within that, though, obviously the label rates there's a lot of a research, so you want to be staying within those because if you go under, you could just be letting you wouldn't be getting effective disease control. Right. And then also, if you're at really high disease severity and you've assessed that, then stick to the higher label rate if that is what the label says to do. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so is it, I mean, it feels like a little bit of magic sometimes, but I, I think it's just, there'd be a lot of people who would have a feel for that in the field as well. Um, we've got another fun one for you, Fran, um, from West PB. So can you explain the development of resistance to group sevens? Um, have you seen group, it actually says group seven strobies. So group 11s are strobilurins, strobilurins. Yeah, strobilurins. Um, and group sevens are SDHIs. So it might be, maybe if we can compare those two. Um, and have you seen any levels in these populations or in your general survey work? So I guess maybe touch on the difference in development between a group seven and a group 11 and whether we've seen any group 11s as well. Yeah. So um, there is no full resistance of group 11 fungicides or strobilurins in, uh, in the blotches. And that basically, the reason for that is because there's a, there's a genetic feature 
that avoids uh, a particular mutation from happening. That mutation doesn't happen, so there is no full resistance. That doesn't mean that resistance cannot develop, but it was it will be partial. Okay, it will be a sort of a reduced sensitive situation, right? And um, no, we haven't seen any of that in in Australia yet. Uh, fortunately, we have seen estrobilirubin resistance in wheat powder mildew. So that basically, you know, it, which is which is quite common, right? And and we expect to see estrobilirubin resistance in their blotches at some point, just because you know estrobilirubins are used and it's a natural process. I mean, it's just part of the game, right? Um, now, uh, in other organisms, resistance to estrobilirubins is is total. So once it develops, um, the population is totally immune to the compound, and actually the crop dies of phytotoxicity if you increase the rate, and rather than actually you know affecting the the pathogen, so the pathogen is quite happy. Um, with SDHIs, the situation is a bit different, right? Um, you don't have that total immune situation, so you've got mutations that can provide very high levels of resistance. But, but you don't have that sort of situation where the compound is totally ineffective, right? Um, now, resistance happens probably as quickly as in SEHIs as it happens in, in the strobilurins, right? So that actually is a commonality between the two. Um, and in this particular case, um, probably as uh, 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 you are aware, um, resistance to SEHIs um, has been previously found in, in Australia, in the York Peninsula. Uh, we have also found, Wesley has found mutations in the, in the Air Peninsula as well. And uh, we also got mutations that confer associated with resistance in the, on the border with Victoria. And, and now here in Western Australia, it's, it's a spot form, right? It's not net form, okay? But we knew that it was going to happen. Um, so earlier today, we had a, we had a catch up uh, with, a, with the A-Friend team, right? So all the different experts that are involved in this network. And it was a very uh, interesting uh, proposition, right? And it was, well, if we know that this is going to be the case, that, you know, in regions where Bali, Bali on Bali is actually happening more frequently and people are using uh, Sistiva Fron or other, other SEHIs, right? Now that we've got foliar SEHIs as well, shouldn't we actually target those regions, right? And just make sure that people doing that are fully aware of, you know, what the consequences actually can be. And, and I think that, you know, I particularly think that that's a very important move and that we should be doing that, right? Just targeting those places and making sure that the information gets, gets to them. But I think that I'm just deviating from the question. So Kylie, please bring, bring us back to yeah, no, no, you got there. You definitely covered the difference with group sevens and elevens. Um, and I think it's it's also good to remember the sevens are uh, similar to the group threes as well in that you can have that kind of more gradual build up rather than a quick right. cut off. But it is all about the frequencies in the population, which we're lucky to be getting closer to with this study and the one in the York Peninsula as well. And we will keep trying to get those questions down as well. Um, before I forget, we had one before the session as well, which I just wanted to touch on, um, which is just more general barley um, related. Um, and I know we've got Jeff in the background there. But the question was, DPIRD is demonstrating trial work to the industry this season using standalone tebuconazole as a foliar fungicide for late season loose smut control. Is this wise given tebuconazole's resistance profile in Bali? Um, did you maybe want to start that, Fran, and then throw to Jeff? Yeah, um, look, uh, um, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. I mean, probably the person asking that question is aware of that, you know, of the details of that study. And, and I, I remember well that fungi services and management practices were incorporated as part of um, um, both uh, the the paper that was presented and the press release that was associated to that work with that work, so I mean using tebiconazole is 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 it doesn't necessarily need to to be bad if we take into account that resistance can develop right and that we shouldn't be using it in a situation where we've got you know clearly we've got resistance in our paddock. So for as long as we we use common sense and tebiconazole is not used as a standalone product um, and we follow we take into account, you know, all those different elements within our IDM 
uh, strategy, it shouldn't be a problem, right? Um, but I think it's a it's a fair question. Um, but but yeah, so just just would like to emphasize that you know as researchers we're not crazy, we're not you know we're not doing crazy things. Um, we try to um, basically follow logic, right? And we just hope that the message is basic around managing resistance get there and people just can apply them. So I think that Jeff can can uh, elaborate on this a little bit more. Thanks, Fran. Thanks, Kylie. Look, it's a good question. Um, the, the, uh, the, the topic being referred to is some work done um, by DPU, by Kit Jarasina in the, in the southern region. And it was just looking at factors that might influence um, transmission of loose smut um, from infected plants into, into seed. Um, and the, the experimental results indicated that a fungicide applied at around flowering can have an impact on transmission of loose mud into seed and that uh, the, the, the fungicide that was being tested, terbuconazole, um, reduced the level of seed infection that were in harvested fr seed from, a, from, an, from an infected crop. Um, I think it's just clear to, to, to make a couple of points about that. Um, the first point is it's not applied for loose mud control. So any of those fun the fungicides we're talking about are not applied to reduce loose smut within the current season crop. And so no, there's not a recommendation that you apply a foliar fungicide to reduce loose smut in your crop. Um, and there's certainly not a recommendation for widespread application of terpiconazole as a foli foliar application for loose smut control. I guess it was more around um, the fact that, that there, this, this uh, difference had been observed and, and maybe in a, in a susceptible variety in a, in a seed production sense, there may be an argument that um, a small area of, of crop could be, could be treated to reduce uh, transmission uh, to seed. And what we know is that, um, is that varieties differ in their, in their response and certainly um, in, in some of the south, south coastal areas, some of the varieties used there have a, have a lower level of seed transmission than in than some other varieties. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for that. Yeah, so once again, it comes back to, yeah, your variety can really give you a lot more options there as a starting point. And that's why we always have it as the foundation for where you're heading with good IDM and good integrated disease management equaling good fungicide resistance management. Uh, we have an, one more question here. Um, so from Peter Wilson. Um, are hybrid populations of spot and net form of net blotch likely to develop resistance more rapidly? Um, sorry, the question was if the populations are likely to develop resistance. Yeah, so if the hybrid. Yeah, so if the hybrid of spot and net, um, right. are they more likely to develop resistance more rapidly than just pure spot or pure net form? Well, um, I wish we knew, right? Um, Peter, that was, yeah, that's actually a question that uh, Wesley and I have been actually asking ourselves for a while. Um, now, what we can say, um, because we've done the genetic analysis, is that the resistance in, um, sorry, the mutation, the target mutation um, in the hybrid that confers some of the resistance to the DMI chemicals came from net four. Okay, so probably the question is not whether the hybrid can develop resistance faster. Probably the question is whether by hybridizing these organisms can develop resistance faster, right? Um, and it's actually been proved that these organisms hybridize in the field. And, and some, in some cases, when they hybridize, they incorporate particular features and they make them more, um, well, they make them fitter, right? Um, and in this case, you know, they were, you know, the hybrid incorporated a mutation that makes it more resistant to the MIs. And that made that particular hybrid to thrive very well and in some areas of Western Australia, especially on, on Oxford paddocks, right? So, so yes, it's going back. It's not that a hybrid can evolve faster. It is possible that it does, but we don't know that yet. Um, but is, is that the, 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 the point that they can actually hybridize make them actually a better, a better organism, right? Because they can adapt um, better to the selection pressure that is being applied by, by us in the field, right? Yep, good notes there. Yeah, so it's all about, yeah, we're playing a selection pressure game really with what we're putting into the system and then fungi getting selected out of that, even if they are hybrids. 
Um, just a, a quick note for everyone. We do have a survey there. If you could give us like a feedback, it'll literally take a few minutes um, and it'll help us do better extension in the long run. I might just grab the next slide if I can, Fran, while I sure. give people a chance to find that link. And we will send the link out later today along with a link to the recording um, that you can share with your friends and family, <laughs> all other growers and advisors. Um, so we've had plenty of questions. Next one, Fran, is just to let you know, we've got the resistance extension network across the country. We're able to tap into canola specialists, um, heaps of cereal pathology experts and people who've experienced different fungicide resistance cases across the country. Um, so please do get in touch if we go to the next slide. Yep, that just shows the uh, contact details for your WA contacts. So we've got Jeff here at South Perth, Kith in Albany and Andrea in Esperance from DPIRD, as well as Wes and Fran here um, in at the CCDM at Curtin Uni. Um, so we will have the management guide coming together now. Um, there's still gonna be more workshops, info sessions. If you missed the webinar on WA fungicide resistance, that's a good, uh, one to watch get you just up to speed and up to date um, and goes through some of those management messages we've covered in a little further detail. Um, and as always, if you're suspecting fungicide resistance, you know, let us know um, and we can put you in touch with the, the right people, a good regional pathologist to double check what's going and go through the basics. Um, and then if it really does look like it might be, sending it on to our team or another team to make sure we can test it. Um, so with that, um, I'll just check, is there any final word from you, Fran and Wes? Okay. Send them no. the, the time, right? Yeah, yeah. we yeah. just pulled them up, I think. <laughs> yep, brilliant. And um, Jeff's in the background there, so I think he's, are you all good, Jeff? Good. Yep, no worries. Thank you very much. Um, please get in touch. We're happy to hear from you and happy to help um, everyone manage this going into the future. Alrighty. Cheers, guys. Okay, see ya. Bye.